Tonight's reading comes from the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Shokot in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim between Shokot and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Ehah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill you, you will become our subjects and service. Then the Philistines said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of an Ephraite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was very old. <coughs> Jesse's three older sons had followed Saul to the war. The first one was Eliab, the second Abinadab and the third Shaman. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth between Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to your commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going to its battle positions, shouting their war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what had been what had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest son, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep, when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, the 
because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put on a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth pebbles from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those that gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of it into our hands. And the Philistine moved closer to attack him. David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sherimim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. <clears throat> As Saul watched David going to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. This is the word of the Lord. So let's pray. Gracious God, open our hearts now to receive from your word, to be inspired by it. And help us to seek your heart particularly for men, that we might, in our own, each in our own ways, contribute to raising up godly men in this city and wherever we find ourselves. If we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. How do you raise sons today? How do you raise boys who grow into men here in the 20th, 21st century? That's a question I think about a lot these days. I didn't think about it when I just had one boy. Then, then it just seemed a little bit abstract. I just had the one child to deal with. But now I have two. I have two young boys. And I have to work out how to raise them in such a way that they become men. That they grow up to be, um, to, to be worthwhile. To have something to contribute. That they would be men and not simply boys. So I think about this a lot. How do you raise sons today? And I have to say, it feels to me like the world today is a very, very complicated place to raise boys into men. 
a lot of uh, the very traditionally masculine virtues. Men, by the nature of biology, have tended to be fighters, warriors, uh, people who have higher levels of aggression and, and, and who are kind of raised to engage in things of combat. And, and, and all of those qualities aren't necessarily well, qualities anymore. We talk a lot of these days about toxic masculinity, and, and there are reasons for that. You could basically eliminate all violent crime in this country by locking up every man aged 16 to 30. And that's not an exaggeration. That is genuinely, that's just, that's just statistical facts. Basically, all violent crime is committed by a handful of men in that age bracket. And also, you have the problem, of boys are no longer expected to grow up. That's a massive challenge. Men obviously mature physically now. They grow from boys physically into men physically, but that doesn't mean that they have to do anything anymore or there's any expectation they will behave differently. There's actually a whole infrastructure in the world, and to some extent it's, it's encouraged, actually, that boys don't grow up. Because of the aforementioned issue around boys uh, having tendency towards violence, in many ways it's a lot easier to just keep them from doing anything by occupying them in fantasy worlds. You have basically infinite supplies of uh, TV to watch and video games to play and, and particularly depressingly limitless pornography that essentially says to boys, well, actually, you have no need to grow up. Just stay like this forever. Just indulge in these things. You can live in a little fantasy world and stay that way forever. I, I'm of a generation where that was an option to a degree, and it's only become more so over time. And it's startling to me, actually, increasingly, to see people who are kind of my age and sometimes even older, guys now increasingly in their 40s, who live basically the same lifestyles they had when they were teenagers. You can get takeaway whenever you fancy. You can play games all night. And, and the advantage of doing it as an adult is no one's going to tell you not to. In many ways, it's become easier than ever to sink into a world of fantasy, to remain a boy forever rather than grow up into a man. You have the issues of family breakdown, which means that boys often grow up without good male role models, which accelerates all of those previous trends. And you also have the fact that basically girls are just doing better these days. Girls are increasingly outperforming men educationally. They're increasingly outperforming men in the workplace. Basically, only the fact that men have been successful for such a long time and have kept women down for such a long time is the only reason that men have anything going for them anymore in those areas. The reality is, if you look at men and women on their relative merits these days, women are just vastly outperforming men. I was reading a fascinating article recently that the great challenge for women these days is to find a worthwhile man. Basically, uh, women can't find men who are worth marrying. Like, this is a massive problem within the female dating pool because there just aren't that enough worthwhile men relative to women out there these days. These are the issues that men are facing, boys are facing. So you could, I think, fairly say, based on all that, I've got a problem on my hands. So I've got two of them. What am I going to do with them? How am I going to raise my lovely little boys who are delightful right now to be men? Not just to continue as boys forever, but to grow into people who are going to actually contribute something, who are going to matter in the world, who are going to see themselves as having something distinctive to contribute as men to the world around them. Well, I think David is actually a fantastic place to go for this. There are a few more powerful, complicated, uh, and fascinating men in the Bible than David. Uh, and his example, and particularly in this passage, I think really draws out something about what it means to be a man and how to raise boys who are going to be men in these days. And there are three things I really want to draw out about David from this passage that I think are incredibly valuable to the problem I've set out. David had courage in three really important areas. David had the courage to be different. He had the courage to be faithful, and he had courage to be Christ-like. Courage to be different, courage to be faithful, and courage to be Christ-like. So first of all, David has courage to be different. Now we start the reading with the Israelite army trembling before Goliath and the Philistines. 
Saul, who is himself, you know, this, supposedly this great warrior, he is himself a very tall and mighty man, is just like the rest of them. He's meant to lead by example, but he is quaking in his tent. And this goes on for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Israelites all just kind of sit around going, oh, what do we do? He's really big. What are we going to do about this? They're all sat around just waiting for something to happen in the hope that someone will come along and rescue them. Now, we know that God's going to do that, but their attitude isn't exactly on the front foot. They're not, they're not kind of seeking God or trying to work out what to do or acting in faith. They're just huddling around in cowardice. They are trapped in fear. And then David comes along in, in, around verses uh, uh, 20, 22, 23 onwards, and he, he, he brings food initially, and, uh, and he starts talking to people. And what's fascinating is the response. I love the little interaction with his big brother. It's a, it's a classic brotherly interaction, isn't it? Well, what's, what's going to happen for the man who, who defeats this guy? Shut up, David. You're an idiot. Anyway, you're just full of wickedness. I know you've just come to get a nosy at the battle. Get lost. As, as a younger brother, uh, I have an older brother, and uh, I can sympathize. I can definitely sympathize with that interaction. What's fascinating there is David just comes and asks a question. David says, well, well what's going to happen? What, what would happen if we, if, if we fought this guy? Because somebody beat him. And they all just bat him down. All these men quaking in fear. And the boy comes along and asks the question, well, what can we do about this? And they all respond with anger, with cynicism. Why? Because I think he's exposing their cowardice. And it's fascinating, when people step forward, when they are willing to be different, to ask the hard questions, to do things differently, to act in faith, they will invariably find opposition from their peers. I think especially this is true amongst men. Many years ago, I, I decided to run for public office on the Isle of Man, the equivalent uh, 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 to be a member of the House of Keys, which is the equivalent of the House of Parliament. So it would have been the equivalent of being an MP. It's fair to say I didn't get very far. I wasn't very successful. That's a story for another time. But what was fascinating was that when I put myself out there, immediately this response came back of negativity. And it, it started out, I put out a little, I rang the local newspaper and said, look, I'm planning to put my hat in the ring, uh, and, and this is who I am. And immediately... A group of men <laughs> commented on the news site, basically slagging me off and bringing me down. Oh, he lives over there. Well, why doesn't he stay over there? What's he trying to do being an MHK in this area? Oh, he's just, oh, he looks a bit young, doesn't he? What does he think he's got to contribute? It's fascinating. I, and this was in within literally hours of this going out. And you think, who sat at their, who sat in front of their computer first thing in the morning and see someone, a young man, put themselves out there, goes, you know what, the first thing I need to do is tear them down a peg. The answer, it turns out, is actually quite a lot of people. And unfortunately, I don't think the world's gotten better in that respect, unfortunately. If you are step forward and are, and are willing to stand out, there will always be people ready to tear you down. And I think that's particularly true for men and young men these days. If we want to raise men, and not just boys, we need to teach them to be willing to face criticism, to take the consequences of standing out. Then we need to raise men who have the courage to be different. If we're going to raise men in the church, that is absolutely essential. We need to raise men who have the courage to be different. Secondly, David has the courage to stay faithful, to trust in God. Saul is, isn't particularly encouraging when David comes to speak to him. As, as I've said, all these, Saul is behaving like all these other men around him. Saul, uh, David comes to Saul and says, I will fight the Philistine. I will trust in the Lord. And, and Saul's answer is basically, well, you're going to die, mate. You've not got a chance. Don't, don't bother. It's not worth it. It's really not. Saul is not encouraging at all. And David's response to Saul is an absolute masterclass in faith. He seems to puff himself up at first. Well, I've looked after my father's sheep. I've fought lions. I've fought bears. This guy's not any different. The Lord, but then he follows up with this wonderful statement of faith. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear 
will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David's confidence isn't rooted in his own abilities, but in who is the Lord and who his God is. I've talked a lot about uh, men being worthwhile and contributing to society and, um, and, and, and uh, you know, the, the kind of challenge of masculinity today. But it is striking that, in a sense, one of the, the great sources of that is insecurity in men. A lot of men don't really know what standards they should measure themselves by. And what tends to happen is they go down one of two extremes. One is the one I've already mentioned, that they retreat into kind of fantasy and avoid the world. And the other classic one is they, they kind of try to present themselves as being exceptionally successful. It's fascinating to me that so many men are really actually quite basic in their, in their desires and the way they present themselves. There are so many men who still crave the fast car. In the, in the 21st century, it is surprising how many men, when they get the opportunity to buy an expensive car, will jump on it immediately and feel really good about it and put it on social media. You might, you know, we, we, we often think that these are kind of crude desires that perhaps we've left behind. They're not at all. Men will so often jump straight on these things. Men will measure themselves by the girls they can attract, by their success at sports, all those really simple, actually quite basic desires that are rooted in this, in quite a fundamental level. Men never really escape those. And, and, and if they're not taught to desire anything else, they'll end up just craving them and showing them off. Our society so often raises men who either choose the kind of fantasy dropout life or just the kind of trying to exhibit yourself uh, as being great and successful and having money and all of that kind of stuff. And the model of David shows us an alternative that says that true masculinity isn't rooted in success or failure, but in faithfulness. True masculinity isn't rooted in your ability to do stuff, but in who God is and seeking to be faithful to him. Because the thing about trusting in your own strength is it will always, always, in the end, be inadequate. But what David shows is a different model. Masculinity rooted not in success or failure, but in faithfulness. David has the courage to be faithful. I was tempted to suggest we cut the reading off before he actually fights Goliath. Because at that point, as far as we know, when we're reading the story, he's just a young fool who's off to his death. But he's not, because he's trusting in the Lord. There's a wonderful, to quote from a different story about men of courage, the uh, uh, in, in, in the story of Daniel and uh, Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, about to be thrown into the fiery furnace, they say, well, we trust in our God to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're going to get chucked in anyway because we are going to stay faithful. And that is the model of David here. He stays faithful. He has the courage to be faithful, even not knowing the outcome, simply trusting in what the Lord has called him to do. We need to seek ra- to raise up men who choose to be faithful. And finally, David has the courage to be Christ-like, to imitate Jesus in all his ways. He doesn't know that yet. He's obviously living in the time before Jesus. And yet, David, through his life and pattern, in some really important ways, points us forward to Jesus. There's some fascinating little details in this passage. Notice that David goes to fight with his shepherding gear, He is the shepherd boy who will become the shepherd king, the good shepherd, if you will. He goes to risk his life, to lay down his life for the flock of Israel. And look who he's fighting. Again, worth noting, he's fighting this man, Goliath, after 40 days and 40 nights in a sort of wilderness place, if you like. And he's fighting Goliath, and how is Goliath described? He's giant but he's also covered in scale, scale armor. Goliath is a a serpent, if you will. He is standing in for Satan in this story. So the good shepherd, after 40 days and 40 nights, goes to fight the serpent to save the flock. All of this should point us to the fact this is a Jesus story. And David's courage is manifested not just in the ways that he uh, is willing to stand out or the ways that he's willing to be 
faithful, but in his very Christ-likeness. And this points us forward to something fundamental, that the true key to being a man, to being a man who is actually worthwhile, contributing to society, being all that God has made them to be, is to raise men who are following Jesus, who are seeking to be Christ-like in all their ways. The key to raising men who will be true men lies in following in the path of Jesus and in being truly Christ-like. Now, you could reasonably think at this point that I'm just using this Bible passage to deal with my own issues. I've got two young boys. I need to work out what to do with them. And that's what I've been speaking to. But I think this, these principles apply to all of us, actually. We might not have sons of our own, or perhaps we have sons of our own who were well past the point of having any easy influence over. But there, I can absolutely guarantee you that in this parish, probably living in the houses just around us, there are boys who are lost. There are boys who are either lost in fantasy, who are desperately trying to avoid life because they have no idea what to do with themselves or how to be men. And there will be boys who are violent and committing crime. And there will be boys who are uh, desperately trying to present themselves as wealthy and successful. Uh, There are boys who will be driving around in fast cars because it makes them feel like men and nothing else really does. All of those boys are probably living within a stone's throw of this church. You've probably met some of them out and about. You probably know one or two. There are boys all around who are lost and crying out for a vision of what it means to be a man in a society that absolutely refuses to give them one. And and here at St. Stephen's Church, you have a massive opportunity with those boys. You have a massive opportunity to model, to teach, to offer a different vision of manhood, not rooted in any of those things, but rooted in following in the path of Jesus. You have a massive opportunity to reach those lost boys and raise them up to be men who are willing to stand out and be different, men who are faithful and men who are Christ-like, to offer a model of masculinity completely different from the world around us. It is really hard to raise boys today, but there is such an opportunity for us in these days to raise up spiritual sons from boys into men, to raise up spiritual sons who are currently desperately lost and in need of a different vision of what it means to be a man. We have a wonderful opportunity before us to raise spiritual sons who go from being boys who live in fantasy or, or failure or the mirage of worldly success and to raise those boys to be men of courage, men after God's own heart, just as David was. Amen. much.